so our last speaker of the day is Michael Quitt. Uh, Michael is a visiting fellow at Yale's Information Society Project. And he's also the host of the podcast Tech Empire, uh, which is areas of uh, research include education technology, the global digital economy, tech startups, safe and smart city initiatives, big data, and free and open source software. And much of Mike's work is seen through the lens of digital colonialism, uh, with a focus on how that is manifesting itself in physical spaces. And that is also more or less what Mike will talk to us about today. Mike, go for it. All right, thank you for uh, having me here. So let me bring up, uh, share my screen and bring up the slideshow. Um, <clears throat> and okay, can you see? All good. All right. Um, so today I want to uh, talk about what's going on in city spaces. And I've done quite a bit of research on a bunch of intersecting subjects and I'll talk for about 30 minutes and then we can do a short Q&A. So let's jump in. Um, all right. So before we talk about safe and smart cities, uh, I want to contextualize uh, the topic to digital colonialism. And uh, digital colonialism is, in short, the use of technology for political, economic, and social control of a foreign territory or a group of people. And it's achieved principally through the ownership and control of the stuff of the digital world. So that's your software, your hardware, your network connectivity. It's the data and the platforms and things like that. So if we're going to compare to classic colonialism, if you want to call it that, um, there are some key differences. Among them is uh, obviously under the age of colonialism that opened up over the last few hundred years, there was a process of violent settler conquest. There was genocide. There were um, raids of, of land and, and taking over the land and um, all sorts of things like that that does not occur in the digital era. However, there are some parallels to the digital order, and those include um, infrastructural forms of domination. So one of the case examples that we can look at here is the construction of railroads. This is from an article on the construction of railroads in Kenya. And you can see from the graph that, or from the uh, image, that they built them, the European settlers, built them to bypass local villages and to connect up military outposts and places of labor exploitation so that they could bring raw materials back to the coast, ship them out to the mother country and process for manufacturing, things like that. So uh, the point here is that the, design, the ownership and the design of the critical infrastructure is built in the interest of those who own and control it. So another um, infrastructure or uh, structure that was used is the Panopticon. So in South Africa, when diamonds and gold were discovered, um, again, European settlers uh, decided that that's their land because the minerals are there that they want. And they took over the mining, they took over the land, and they forced Africans into these panoptic uh, housing compounds. And a panopticon is a structure that has uh, an authority, a prison guard, 
or a, a boss at a workplace that's basically sits in the middle of the structure and the people who are being watched by the authority don't know whether or not that person is watching them at any point in time and so they wind up having to behave as if they are being watched and the premise is that they'll self-police their behavior in accordance with what the authority figures want and uh, so if we're to look at things in digital colonialism it's more or less invisible so if you look at something like uh, Facebook it's kind of like a panopticon in the sense that you don't know if somebody is watching you at any point in time um, especially given uh, we'll return to in a second that um, the, the uh, NSA, National Security Agency, piggybacks off of their surveillance and um, they could be watching or looking into people at any point in time. And so there are panoptic features in the digital technology world and the structure is built in a way that they are a centralized intermediary where all information goes through them instead of being designed for people to connect with each other in ways that don't go through these um, you know, centralized intermediaries like Facebook or Twitter. Um, so the point here is that uh, these are design features that benefit those who own and control the infrastructure. So to speed through this a little bit, um, who owns the digital tech world? Um, there's a lot of talk about China, but if you look at, here's a chart of the top 100 biggest countries, uh, uh, companies in the world. Um, the United States is king. And that's especially true outside of US borders and Chinese borders, where there are some Chinese tech like TikTok and Huawei's 5G equipment, but for the most part, most of the things that people do are on American-based firms and um, China is a uh, distant competitor. So um, this is a slide from the NSA, just, um, you know, we talked about uh, just now um, and how this is one element in the digital world that is built around political control, whereas the big tech corporations are basically spreading their products throughout the world so that they can make as much money as possible in their colonizing markets. All right, so I just want to put this into a, 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 a bigger context for a second um, before we turn to the safe and smart cities. So right now, something that's not talked about very much is that there are limits to growth and there's mass inequality. So the left slide here is from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number 12 of 2019. And it shows that the high income countries are consuming about 26 tons per person per year. I believe that's now up to about 28. The low income countries are about two. And uh, it's, it's believed that the sustainable limit for what we have which is almost 8 billion people is about 6 to 8 tons per person per year. We're also over extracting if you read the entry on sustainable development goal number 12 again from 2019 we're extracting about 100 billion tons that's a 2020 number um, per year as, as a human species and the sustainable limit is somewhere around 50. So if we can't grow our way, if we have to cap material resource use, then that means that we need to redistribute wealth and we have to stop the growth of consumer-oriented economy and instead um, start producing for need. And that's what we need for a just and sustainable transition um, so that we don't burn and destroy habitats in the planet. Um, and there's 
a lot of literature on that. I, I recommend checking out Jason Hickel. The right chart there is just material footprint and GDP, and it just goes to show that if we shift to, to services, things that don't seem like they use a lot of material resources, um, material use is still keeping, it's still going up just alongside GDP. Um, so in that sense, there's also with digital colonialism, an unequal exchange and division of labor, and where you have the high income countries that are doing the most lucrative stuff in the economy, um, and they own the intellectual property, they own the data, they own the means of computation, the cloud centers, um, the computer chips, and so on. And the poor countries extract raw materials like minerals and cash crops. They produce cash crops for export, and that keeps this kind of inequality going. So um, within this con the Mike, I think we have lost your voice. Yeah, I'm not hearing you. You can't hear me? Ah, you're back. Okay, go on. Okay. Um, all right, so let me just, um, can you see again the screen? Can yes. you hear me? Okay. Yep, both, I can hear you and we can see your screen. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, so um, there's, a, there's a lot of now new technologies for policing, for military, uh, law enforcement intelligence, and, and today I want to talk about safe and smart cities. So... Um, there's, within this context, we should be worried about protest and unrest, um, resource use on these things as well, um, but um, the use of new technologies to police communities and keep the status quo intact, intact is a, a huge threat to civil rights and liberties and also resolving the inequality crisis, which directly relates to and is actually inextricable from solving the climate crisis. Um, so um, here, I've done a lot of research on the use of uh, CCTV cameras uh, for safe and smart city initiatives. And this started when I was in South Africa and also here in New Haven, Connecticut, where our former police chief, Ian Esserman, who used to be with the NYPD, brought over this, uh, you know, camera, let's use cameras everywhere philosophy to New Haven, Connecticut. So I saw in my own local area the proliferation of cameras. Um, so um, so what's, what does modern policing tech look like? Um, so an old school camera system used to be an analog camera with fuzzy image. It was maybe one in a gas station or a store, and the footage would, if they recorded it, would go into a, some room in the building. And if an incident occurred that the police wanted to look into, they'd have to go building to building wherever cameras were, and there weren't a lot of them, and they'd have to review the footage by hand. And what happened over time is that First, um, cameras got digitized so they could be brought in to computer systems. And then sophisticated software called VMSs, uh, video management systems or video management software, were developed so that they could start to bring in multiple cameras and manage a large network of cameras instead. So this is your command and control rooms um, that you see in the movies and on television where you have um, law enforcement uh, uh, officers sitting in a, in, in a room and there's tons of uh, a wall of cameras um, or a giant screen on the wall where you can see all these different cameras and so they can manage it. On top of that, there's now these plug-in surveillance networks where local businesses can start to plug their 
cameras into the network, or if, if you want to put it another way, the cops can plug their network into their cameras. In other words, they're adding their cameras onto the to the total pile into the network, and that increases the eyes of the um, police so that instead of having a few hundred or a few thousand cameras, they can have many thousand cameras and they don't have to pay for it. Um, on top of that, to make sense of all that, they use video analytics and video analytics can detect faces, but it can also detect objects like is it a car, is it a person, it could detect behaviors, are they walking, are they running, um, and so on. So I wanted to just show real quick um, a short demo here of um, a video. Let me pull this up. And um, On. And uh, it, it'll show you how video analytics works. And this is by a firm called um, BriefCam. And BriefCam is one of the major video analytics firms They're based, based out of Israel. And let me just set this share. All right. Um, okay, so let me just switch over the screen to the brief cam demo. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we're seeing you. Okay, all right, so uh, I'm not going to play the whole video, but here you can see there are cars on the road. This is what it normally looks like, and what they can do is they can condense traffic so. Actually, these cars are not this on the on the road at the same time because it would take too long to watch the footage if it was just one or one or a few cars at a time. So they can condense footage from a camera into into a small clip, and then they can start to pick out different things. They can make it all the red cars, and they can do all sorts of tricks like this with video analytics. They do it. Um, you know, when people are walking by here, they're selecting out anybody who's riding a bike. And that, and again, they're doing that into a short scene. Um, so you can see that these things are actually kind of overlapping. Um, and the, the whole point of it is that um, this, doing the, using this kind of technology helps to, um, make sense of all of these thousands of cameras that these um, 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 police and, and, and law enforcement agencies are, are using. All right, so let's go back to the, uh, all right, can you see the, am I back in the demo or in the uh, slideshow? Yep. Okay, you see the next slide? Uh, I'm seeing, now I am seeing the next slide. Yeah, development okay. in the 21st century. Oh, now it's video analytics again. Okay, I got you. All right, so we're, we're back on. So um, bringing this together then, you have these video management systems, and these can be brought into more centralized centers that pool together data, not just video. So you have real-time crime centers. And what they'll do is they'll not only bring in data from sensors like video cameras and acoustic sensors and things like that, but they'll bring in records from the census and criminal um, records histories and, and all sorts of different databases. And then they can try to work that all that data together for both in the moment um, you know, what they call situational awareness. So you have police who are out in the street and you can alert them to things or you can communicate with them from the command and control center. Um, and you can also do predictive analytics to try to predict things like when the next crime might occur or, um, you know, patterns of crime and things like that. And then you can do 
Um, Post-incident investigations. So once a crime does occur, you have footage recorded um, and, and you can bring in information with all this data. And so what we have is a rapid expansion of, of, of surveillance, the sophistication of it, and the integration of it into the carceral pipeline. Um, so policing courts, uh, there's a lot of sophisticated systems um, in the prisons now that are trying to, um, that are expanding out, bringing the same kind of logics into these things. Um, so here's, um, I just want to give some case examples. This is a, a project called Vumicam in South Africa. Vumicam, oh, sorry, I got the wrong side. Here we go. Um, so Vumicam here, um, this slide uh, shows uh, basically how the system works. So in February, I want to say 2019, uh, this company, Vumicam, announced that they would be rolling out 15,000 15, cameras into the city of Johannesburg. And they started off in the suburbs. And as they rolled out fiber internet, they would start putting cameras up. Since then, they've announced that their ambition is to have 100,000 cameras rolled out. And the chart in the middle shows the inequalities that exist. So in the top left little picture of from Google Earth, of um, that's of a, a rich suburb. You can see there's swimming pools. In the top right, those are shacks packed in. And you can see a view from the street in the boxes below that. And then in the and then the bottom most one, you can see this kind of gray patch in the top right corner, and that's how densely packed in those shacks are. So the places all these cameras are going is in those suburbs where you can see the trees if you look at that bottom aerial snapshot. There's those are all suburbs. And there's poor people who live by in shacks. And while it's not only poor people who do crimes in the sense that there's organized crime that um, winds up occurring in the suburbs where um, people drive in and they do muggings um, or, or they rob houses, um, the inequality in South Africa, uh, which in the post-apartheid era has actually gone up, uh, is driving is in, in keeping intact in high incidence of muggings and burglaries and, and robberies. So uh, in that context, that's where Vumicam comes in. They say, well, well, we'll just put cameras everywhere. And they have a sophisticated system that they set up. They use brief cam. They use um, other li license plate readers and things like that. And they wind up, um, you know, adding uh, all these cameras in, and the logic is to just keep adding as much as you possibly can. Now, I want to go back a little bit here and talk about Microsoft. So I ran an article on Boomicam at, at Vice News, and if you look it up, you can, you can get it there, and it explains the whole thing. I also ran another article last year at The Intercept, um, called the Microsoft Police State, and uh, Microsoft is is offering a ton of technologies for safe and, and, and smart cities, especially the safe cities part. Um, so they built their own in-house product, although they did contract out for some of the tech, but it goes under their own label, and it's often called the domain awareness system. They built it with the NYPD, and then they spread it out to some other places like uh, Singapore, Brazil, um, Atlanta, and um, Washington, D.C. And they basically run one of those complex command and control centers that brings all the data in. Microsoft also has tens of known surveillance partners. Um, Genetech, which does a video management software that we were talking about, 
um, PredPol, predictive policing, things like that. And um, so, um, and I do want to check on the PredPol. I'm pretty sure that's from memory, but um, I'd have to go back and look that up. But definitely Axon Taser gone. So um, they also are demoing new forms of tech to roll out in cities. So they have something they built called the Microsoft Advanced Patrol Platform. And it's a surveillance vehicle platform. And you can see um, uh, it, it's equipped with cameras. It rolls around the city, it works with their Azure cloud, and they're piloting it in Durban and um, in uh, Cape Town. And um, there you can see a Microsoft cop car in the bottom right, but actually when they're out on the street, they don't paint the Microsoft insignia on it when they're using the solution. Um, so uh, one more uh, bit of technology, I think as we're talking about, I just published an article at The Intercept, about social media surveillance. So there's this company called uh, Shadow Dragon that does uh, social media surveillance. And basically what they do is they don't get access to private stuff. So if you're on, say, Facebook and you have your settings on private for your posts, they can't see, see that information. Facebook could. Um, ostensibly the NSA could, but not uh, a company like Shadow Dragon. Um, but what they do is they, they built software that can pull information from anything that's been publicly posted from all the social media platforms, plus other things like Amazon. So if you make your wish list on Amazon public, they can pull information from that, from websites, from comments and user sections on websites, things like that. So they have over 120 websites they pull from. And then they have an, a sophisticated system set up to try to figure out who you are if you're using an alias and to see who you're friends with and to map out networks and to do investigations, which basically means um, you're subject to um, police and corporations, they sell to corporations, um, ICE immigration and um, other countries, uh, India they're being deployed in and, and Asia Pacific. Um, and really all over the world, according, but we don't know exactly where. The CEO wouldn't tell me where. Um, and that allows authorities to bring in massive amounts of information about people and piece it together in ways that are, people aren't aware of. They basically can follow you around the web and pull out a lot of information about you. So I want to close out talking about activism and you know why all this surveillance matters. Um, first, I just want to say before I make or talk a little bit about, you know, this case example in South Africa, um, that there's no, really no demonstration that any of this works beyond anecdotes on the premise of what they say they're trying to do. In other words, in the early first decade of the 2000s, I believe the example was Chicago when I was doing my research. Um, they had something like, the city had something, the police had something like 20 something cameras. And it wasn't, you know, violence and mayhem and crime everywhere and, and the city is just, you know, out of control um, place to be. And yet today they have something like 35,000 cameras. And they're expanding out all the time. And uh, the question becomes, um, what is the need for this? Is this really what we want as a society. Do we want to be moving into a situation in which basically to be in a public space and to be interacting on the internet, um, you're basically being filmed in, in physical spaces and online you're being filmed as well. I also want to add on because I, I mentioned smart cities and I didn't talk much about them, but one of the things that's appealing about video surveillance footage is that it can be used for more than just policing crime and protests and things like that. It can be used for city administration. And cities like the idea that they, they can use video stuff, uh, you know, video analytics and, and video footage to manage the city. So they can, they can try to plot out foot traffic and, you know, heat maps of, of how often people walk by certain areas you know, real estate can get some value out of that in, in determining, you know, what the high value real estate is. Waste removal is something they talk about. We can use video footage to monitor, you know, 
picking up trash and things like that. And um, so once we start expanding out the use cases for these things beyond policing, the argument's going to be, well, but we're using this for, for basic city administration anyways. And so now you have more than just a justification that's needed on behalf of city authorities to use this stuff for crime. They're going to say, well, we, we're using it for everything. So anyways, I want to close out here uh, before we go to Q&A and talk about why surveillance matters um, and just give one case example about protesting. So when I was in South Africa in 2015 and in 2016, we had the largest student pro protests since the Soweto, iconic Soweto uprisings in 1976. And there, that was student uprisings against the apartheid oppressors. And um, here it was a uh, protest first against Cecil Rhodes. You see they're removing his statue there. He's a, a British mining colonizer. And, um, and they, were, they eventually demanded free higher education. So it was expanded in 2015 um, to ask for free higher education, decolonization of the university, insourcing labor, and sexual justice. And so one of the things the universities did is they started to put up cameras. I, I took these pictures here on my campus and um, they started putting cameras up everywhere. And then they started targeting the leaders in the activist groups and um, they started to do things like suspend them or threaten to suspend or expel them and they use footage in courts. And once those cameras go up, uh, generally speaking, they um, stay up um, as well. And here you can see Hong Kong protesters. There's an article, I think it was last year, where they were, they were firing lasers at the cameras to try to disrupt them from being able to see them. And so the impacts of surveillance can have chilling effects. It can make people not want to attend protests or be seen in public at these, at these areas. It could lead to repression and the targeting of activist groups and, and protesters, immigrants, and so on. Um, you know, it's it's potentially permanent. So um, once a lot of these cameras go up, they're probably going to stay up, as, as I just noted. And um, even if you trust your government today, uh, doesn't mean you're going to trust them tomorrow. Um, and um, so grassroots campaigns, um, you know, need to um, be active about these things and, and questioning them and challenging them. That's part of democracy um, and that's part of participating in your society. And a lot of these technologies run ahead of uh, regulation and uh, the rules that are created and those you know, police and, and city authorities just put this stuff out there because they can. And it hasn't been regulated, it hasn't been legislated, legislated properly. So I'll leave it there, and um, and then we can we can do some questions. Thanks, Mike. Um, that was great. Um, uh, it's always a, a pleasure to see um, um, the control that uh, the state um, exerts over us and likes to exert over us. It's very nice to see this laid out so clearly. Um, also, because most of us don't realize to what extent we are being watched. Um, and um, I, in that context, I think your example of um, oh, what's the, the article that you just now published in The Intercept talks about Shadow. No, I forget the name of the company. Shadow Dragon. Shadow Dragon, right. What yeah. I find interesting there specifically is that um, they, they do not claim to have access to hidden data. They only use the public data. But because there's so much and because it's automatically aggregated, they can very quickly uh, make draw conclusions of information that is publicly available, but tell so much more about you than you realize uh, is uh, available about you. Um, and that touches on, I mean, this is, you know, this touches on so many things. Um, uh, the, the, the automatic rollout of, uh, of, this monet, of these monitoring tools uh, uh, lack the existence of checks and balances on a municipal or on a state level where people are uh, given a certain control over how they are being watched, right? Because as you say, um, you might you might trust the government now, but you might not trust the next government who has the same powers. But of course, this is part of that slippery slope of um, 
you know, I, I don't have anything to hide. They came for the they came for the gays first, and then they came for the Jews. And, and as long as uh, you are not being targeted, then you don't feel like there is a threat, right? So, um, but also with that, uh, this is really why I, I was looking forward to hearing you speak today. Is the c control uh, that is uh, that you show is exerted by municipal and state authorities is a direct um, a descendant of the uh, of the society of the spectacle that was identified by the situationists in the 50s and 60s and 70s, where society was designed to force you into certain behavior. And we have now, you know, we sort of like all come to accept that the Coca-Colas of this world uh, try to manipulate us into a certain behavior, buying more Coca-Cola. Um, but this has gone so much further where we be, are being um, forced into a, um, a straitjacket of behavior uh, through uh, this, this monitoring. And the, specifically the example that comes to mind with this is uh, you talk about predictive pol policies, policing and predictive analytics, which is essentially thought crime, right? Identifying crimes before they happen. Um, and, uh, and that makes people afraid as soon as they, because by the time they realize it's going to be too late because then they're already being monitored and there are no systems in place to ameliorate this, these, um, these processes. But they are, it's already happening. Fault crime is being identified to put people in jail. Uh, and the United States is ahead in the game in this. Uh, there are so many people, well, so many, there are several Americans, mostly um, of uh, backgrounds where these people are Muslim, who have been arrested and put go, put in jail for decades because supposedly they were planning uh, a terrorist attack, but the proof is is extremely flimsy or not existing at all. But certainly they did not do anything. But they are put away in jail because the information exists that might allow you to construe that they maybe think about thought about uh, committing a crime. Anyway, that's that's my input. Thank you very much. Um, Ellie, John, Natalia, do you have uh, any, do you, you want to ask the mic something, give a remark, an idea, a question, a thought? Uh, well, I have a little anecdote, I think, which came to mind before the talk, but it's a little bit uh, solidified now, <laughs> which was uh, the ubiquity of cameras around and how I'd also like was under the impression that they don't actually help prevent crimes the amount of visible cameras around but uh, um, I was um, so I was doing a public space dance workshop so I was behaving non-normally shall we say in public space um, and about 500 meters we were in a group but we all were doing separate things we all came back together again and then we went to see each other's performances in different spaces in the city we got about 500 meters from where i had been performing and a police van pulled up and said excuse me we want we need to talk to you to me because someone had multiple people apparently had called the police to say there's a young woman behaving very strangely in public space but i was astonished that they found me 500 meters further um, so I, I mean, they, it was fine. You know, I, I hadn't done anything wrong <laughs> and broken any laws or anything. So, um, but that was just a really interesting experience of, oh, I am being watched all the time, even by the people yeah. who were apparently concerned to see me behaving oddly, had chosen to contact the authorities rather than, you know, maybe yell across the road, Hey, are you okay? So yeah, that's, it's so interesting to put that into a context of this all benefits the owner of the infrastructure <laughs> in a way. Um, and yeah, what space is there to not behave in the way you are expected to in public? But yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, um, I mean, there's a few things that are, are worth noting. One is that people should be aware and they should be educated, right, about how these systems work and, and what they do. And if you're oblivious to it, then in terms of a chilling effect, it won't have so much of a chilling effect 
on on people, right? I mean, certainly there's some people who just don't care, um, so it doesn't have a chilling effect on them. But um, a lot of people don't necessarily like it, and it very well does have a chilling effect. And um, people should be educated. So if they get more educated about things, then it's going to make that problem worse. Um, and um, so that's, I think that's one thing to note. Another thing to note is that the burden of justification should be on the authorities for putting this out there. When we look at a place like China in the West or in the global North, uh, people will say, well, it's very dystopian, you know, that kind of thing. But I think people still kind of cling to this idea that, well, but you can use these cameras to solve crimes, which is true, right? Sometimes they can. It's, I mean, the more cameras you, so a second thing I think worth noting is that even though there's no good studies that really show any sort of um, improvements in terms of drops in crimes, and even if there are a couple that point to a little bit of an improvement, there's nothing that, that's drastic at all. So then the question becomes, well, how do you, are they failing? Do you want to make them work? Well, one, one thing you could do is just put more cameras up. And the more, you know, so because, I mean, if we just think, take it to its logical conclusion, if everything we did all the time was filmed and then in, the, in, in your face is on it, then there's no way to really get away with anything, right? And um, so the there's a kind of um, logic built into this that uh, in order to make this more and more effective, you need more and more surveillance. and the companies come along um, and they have an economic incentive to put more and more cameras up because they're making money off of it. So, you know, it's kind of working hand in hand in that way. And then you have to say, well, but if it's dystopian for China, you know, why isn't it dystopian for London, which has a ton of cameras, right? They're notorious for it. Um, and some of these other cities that are just putting up more and more and more cameras onto a single network. When this started off, it was it was a one-off, right? But now it's like everywhere you walk, you're in, you're in a singular net, you're under a singular network. Boomicam's whole thing is they want to cover the whole country of South Africa under one network, and that you know, and they bring it into their databases, and that's a different animal. That is a different, qualitatively different system than a system which is just one camera in one spot because now they can follow people around and you can't really escape. There's there's a practical way to sift through this. And so it should be seen as different under law. And law hasn't really regulate, done a good job regulating this. It's the same thing with the social media stuff, right? They can bring, one of the features of Shadow Dragon is it brings up a timeline of what you did with all the data that they pull in. So if I posted on, September 2nd, um, something to an Amazon wish list, and then I went on Facebook and posted something, and then I went to Huffington Post and made a comment in a user section. It's an, it, like, it, as, a, as an individual investigator, without a tool like that, yeah, you can go and find all that stuff. If you make a public post on Twitter, it's fair game for any, any investigator to go and look at your Twitter feed, but what that tool is doing is it's bringing all this into one spot in an automated fashion, it can organize it into a timeline for you, and then it can show you, here's this person doing this on this day at this time. Here's them doing this thing on this day at this time. And it pulls in friends of friends and starts looking into them. So even if you're a legitimate target of a, of a criminal investigation, they can do the same thing for all your buddies who haven't done necessarily long simply because they associate with you. And so a common thread between the social media surveillance and the um, um, video surveillance is that they're taking these um, this public it becomes you know public information that it seems it seems like it's acceptable in a very limited circumstance one camera at a gas station one one investigator looking at your Twitter feed but then it aggregates right and then you start having you start asking the question well is this really what a free society does what's the justification for this do we really actually need this? in order to solve crime, in order to, um, you know, 
Um, find missing children is another thing you can do with camera networks. Sometimes they say, you know, things like that. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it raises the question of what kind of society um, you really want to live in. And there's no real proven, you know, benefits from it in terms of um, any sort of drastic sy systemic change anyways of what they claim to be doing. So you have to ask the question, well, what's the justification for all of this? Why should we go into this um, kind of place um, maybe in, in order to solve crimes and, and, and things like that, we should be working on reducing inequality and, you know, making the society a healthier place, helping people with their mental health, um, all those kinds of things that um, we really need. It won't fix all crime. Not all crime is because of inequality and things like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's also, to me, uh, something of a distraction from the things that that society really should be looking at to deal with their problems. If I may jump in there, I, I, I don't have an answer to this question either. Um, and I think that you're spot on uh, as far as uh, identifying the problem is concerned. Um, but, I, I, but I think what it comes down to, although this is a bit philosophical, is um, the friction between the public and the private or the friction between uh, what is good for the community and what is good for the individual. Um, because often with with um, uh, tools, products, or things like this, is the, the easy justification is something like, but think about the children, right? And, and no one can argue against that something that is uh, that will save uh, or that will that will find missing children is bad. Everyone will say yes, yes, it's bad to, to uh, or it's good to find missing children. Um, well, then we need more more surveillance. Um, but this comes also at a cost, uh, but that cost is something that uh, the collective, in a way, bears, not the individual, because you get your missing child, right? Or you will not lose your child. Um, but at the same time, you are then being surveilled all the time. Well if, uh, well, if you have a young child, maybe that's worth it. But many other people do not. And they are also subject to that surveillance. And they might have negative consequences because indeed they might be uh, the political opponent of the person who is doing the surveying. Uh, but that's not you. You've got the child, right? You're not the political opponent. They're not coming for me. They're coming for someone else. Um, but indeed, today they might come for your neighbor, but tomorrow they might come for you. Uh, but this is very hard. I mean, this is, look at history. This is all impossible to convey. This is, this is, I mean, I'm, I'm making big jumps here, but this is why we had the Holocaust, <laughs> right? Because right, it's a big jump, but, right, were... yeah, there's, well, and like, 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 like said before, you know, the, we saw what fees must fall with the student protests in South Africa. This is what, when, when these kinds of conflicts start occurring, they will bring out and use these tools, any yeah. tool they have in their kit. They will do it yeah. every single time. Exactly. And not only that, but the justification of the kind of do it for the children kind of thing. We can also make another uh, example. We could put a camera in every single room of every single private household where every single day there's domestic abuse going on, child abuse and things like that. And that might be used to prove things, you know, solve crimes and things like that. Um, and um, I think we lost Babak here for a second. No, I'm still uh, here. But I oh, you're still here. Uh, okay. My data. Yeah, right. I mean, look, you can use that to even potentially curb, you know, reduce the rate a little bit, but it's an, an intrusion on being a free human, so in a free society. So I think there has to be serious limits, and we have sleepwalked from these kind of limited case examples to these really advanced and sophisticated systems. Technically speaking, under the law, you could put a million cameras in a single city, or 10 million. You could put one on every light pole if you want. That's been tried. Um, usually, they get pushed back on that. Um, you know, you you know, like it's like, well, what's the limit here? There has to be a limit. And so, um, I think that's where we are in the, in this in this space. And you know, for me personally, I think uh, there's a heavy burden of proof on on the authorities to do these kinds of things and. Society didn't used to have this stuff. 15 years back, it was not like this. So, you know, we don't really need it. And I think we should be spending our efforts on 
improving communities in other ways and keeping our freedoms intact, you know, that's my, my personal position for sure. Well, there, there's definitely uh, over the last decade or last five years, maybe there has been a little bit of a shift towards more awareness as uh, in terms of how much data is being collected and how to what extent we're being watched, right? Uh, hence, in part also driven by Apple specifically uh, with uh, taking away the powers of Facebook, um, requiring people to consent actively, uh, displaying information that is being collected uh, from them. Um, so there is a, a little bit of a shift, but it might be too little too late, right? Uh, because at least with your example, uh, anything you do online, if it can be tied to you as a person, then it will be tied to you as a person. Uh, but then let me finish uh, with one more question for you, um, which is very much related to what you were just saying, that we need to be much more aware, there need to be limits. And, and it goes a little bit back to what you were saying very early on um, about in your presentation about less is more, about that we all use, uh, that our uh, carbon footprint is way too high, and that it is not sustainable, and we need to lower our carbon footprint. No one disagrees with this, right? Or no, almost no one will disagree with this. But um, uh, it does mean that for people like you and me uh, and people around us, we would have to give up a lot to be able to meet yeah. those requirements. So yeah. how in your have you got an idea or a line of thinking? How do we convince people to give up their shit? <laughs> That's a good question. And I think it's one of the reasons that this isn't talked about as much. I highly recommend looking into um, Jason Hickel's work on this. He has a, um, a Twitter feed that's really good. He posts a lot of his papers and other people's papers. Um, but um, basically, the case is pretty compelling. And, um, you know, how do we get people to give up is a big question. Because if you look at a place like, say, the United States, where certainly there, there's overconsumption, um, it's not just carbon footprint, right? It's it's material uh, resource use. Um, you know, they won't have, you know, we wouldn't have, uh, for those who are in the middle class, we wouldn't have as much stuff to consume. But a lot of what we have is really not that, that needed. And, and the studies show that you can live a decent standard of living. I think it was like early post-World War II U.S., Portugal, I think, standard of living, um, kind of, um, you know, decent standard of living for everybody on Earth can be achieved within the, the planetary boundaries and a decent um, kind of low hour work week. But the thing is, um, a lot of people don't want to give up on that. And if we look at the resistance to even acknowledging global warming, um, you know, vaccine, you know, um, you know, I mean, you can only imagine the pushback that will exist on the idea that we need to to curb aggregate growth for the rich countries and redistribute wealth and efforts into getting people out of shacks in the global south so that we can live in harmony with each other and with nature. So we have a very horrible situation in front of us because it's a lot more than just stopping deforestation solar panels, putting up solar panels and wind, and um, getting rid of, you know, cattle farming, it's, when you start bringing in the limits of growth, now the, the hill to climb is way steeper, and we don't have a lot of time. So the question then becomes, what's going to happen for people as this limits of growth thing has picked up in the environmental circuits, and it's going to grow because the scientific evidence is really coming in on it. and we have to be conservative. If we destroy our one and only habitat, it's irreversible. You know, my whole big thing is my favorite basketball player, Kemba Walker, has a busted knee. They can't fix his knee. Now, if you can't fix a, an athlete's knee, what makes you think that you're going to destroy your environment and, and just come in and fix it? It's human arrogance. So the thing is, um, we have to play it conservative. And so if we're in that situation, it's going to take, like, fees must fall in South Africa was simply asking for higher education. They sent in spies. They sent in, um, you know, police, to, in, rubber bullets, tear gas, all this thing, all, all this stuff, right, just for asking for free higher education. Imagine asking to really pry the wealth out of the hands of the rich and redistribute down so that we have a better society. It's going to, it's a real thing. 
So yeah, I think, you know, how do we convince people? Pickle does a nice job and he's very friendly in his approach. And he tries to, you know, to, you know, you talk about flourishing and, and living good lives and having, you know, less onerous jobs and, you know, sharing and all this kind of stuff. It's a great proposition. I don't know how to get people to acknowledge it. You can't even get the media to talk about it very much. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. So it's it's an uphill battle, but it's one that we have to take on. Yeah. It sounds yeah. like the shift that needs to happen is like it's we don't have to find us a, a an ecologically friendly way to keep growing. We have to stop growing. <laughs> yes, aggregately. And since we have so much inequality, that means the people with who are consuming too much have to stop doing that. And we have to help out and help people who don't have enough have more and then cut it out and balance it. The phrase is, you can't burn down the walls of your house to keep yourself warm. You can't destroy your habitat. You can't over exploit it. So that's where we are. And, um, you know, uh, we have no choice but to bring this into the forefront of our consciousness and spend the rest of our lives spending a portion of our lives, each one of us, um, you know, pushing on this issue and discussing it and trying to, to, to move into the direction that's needed because it's, we have no choice. If we destroy the environment, that's it. We're done. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah. This is a good thought <laughs> to end on. Uh, we also went way over time, but uh, I think it was totally worth it. Yeah. Um, thanks again. Uh, Ellie, John, Natalia, do you, this is your last chance to, uh, to jump in. No. Well, okay. just on then, the back of what, oh, yeah. sorry, Go just what, what John was talking about this morning, uh, probably getting or reducing all the surveillance cameras with all the energy they consume is probably a good start. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's Save fully a true. Bit. That's a lot of, of computation and all that stuff too. Yeah. Good point, Ellie. For sure.